Hello and welcome as I uh, am here to catch you from the flip side uh, of Biochem and kind of carry you through uh, chapter three which is really all about cell biology and so we're going to spend the next um, I believe seven or so videos uh, looking at processes that happen within the cell uh, as well as a review of um, cell structure and uh, I will tell you that the primary structure that we will focus on is that of the cell membrane. <clears throat> uh, there's going to be an assignment that's going to have you looking at uh, the other organelles, but we're really not going to spend that much time uh, in class looking at those other organelles. Um, and the reason for that is because our focus, once again, is on homeostasis. And so what structure is driving homeostasis? And for the cell, the structure that is really driving homeostasis is the cell membrane. And so we're going to see that that's where the bulk of our time is going to be spent trying to understand how the cell membrane regulates and maintains a dynamic, dynamic equilibrium in the face of homeostasis. And so um, some very basic information just to kind of get you started uh, thinking about <clears throat> what is this thing called the cell membrane. Right? And the first thing that I want you to draw your attention to is the fact that uh, you will very often see this term plasma lemma. All right. um, plasma lemma is just another term for cell membrane. It's just another term for cell membrane. In fact, you're going to see throughout the semester, uh, you're going to see uh, variations off of plasma lemma. Uh, so when we get into skeletal muscle, you're going to see this term sarcolemma, right, which is going to be uh, the cell membrane of a muscle cell. Right? You're going to see this term neurolemma, right, which is going to be the cell membrane surrounding uh, a nerve cell. And so we're going, to, we're going to be playing off of this idea of the plasma lemma. Uh, but the key is to remember that it is at the basis, it is the cell membrane, right? That is what we are dealing with. Another thing that you need to keep in mind is that the cell membrane is selectively permeable. Okay, now what does that mean? Well, that means that the cell membrane, that means that the cell membrane has the ability to regulate the coming and going. All right. So it has the ability to regulate what is coming into the cell and what is going back out of the cell. Right. So selectively permeable. All right. Permeable meaning that it has the ability, things have the ability to penetrate, but that the membrane can regulate that. Right? Hence the selectivity part of it. Um, and that varies. Right? It has the ability to vary the degree of selectivity or the degree of permeability. So in other words, uh, if you increase the selectivity of the membrane, you're going to decrease the permeability. Increase uh, selectivity, you decrease the permeability. The flip side of that is if you increase permeability, you're going to decrease how selective the membrane is. Now, the way that it does that is through this very, um, albeit at the surface simplistic, but yet once you start looking at it, very complex organization of the cell membrane. So the cell membrane is not just this static uh, structure. Right? It's not just like it's a. It's not like it's a, a, a skin of cellophane that's encapsulating the cytoplasm in the nucleus. Um, the cell membrane is made up of phospholipids. I mean, we talked about this. We talked about this at the end of chapter two. Right? We know that this structure right here is a phospholipid. Why is this a phospholipid? Well, because right here you've got yourself a phosphate group. Right, there's your phosphate group. That's the phospho, that's the phos the phospho part of the phospholipid. 
But if you look just below that, you will notice you've got a glycerol group. That's this guy right here. And you've got two fatty acids. Fatty acid one, fatty acid two. Right? This is a lipid. This is a lipid. So we get this term phos phospholipid because of the fact that we've got a diglyceride. We have two fatty acids attached to a glycerol group. And on top of that, we've got a phosphate group. And then really attached to the phosphate group, we have another molecule that's called choline. And choline just kind of helps, to, uh, helps the cell interact with the aqueous or the water-based environment that is surrounding it. So the, the choline, the choline uh, supports the phosphate. Now, the other thing that you need to um, keep in mind is I'm going to introduce these terms now and we'll talk more about them as we go on. But the, phos the phosphate and the choline are what we define as being hydrophilic. In other words, the phosphate and the choline readily and easily interact with water. The glycerol and the fatty acid, in other words, the lipid down here, this is hydro phobic. In other words, it does not easily and readily mix with water. And so you've got this one molecule that is both hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Right? The cell membrane is both hydrophilic and hydrophobic. But that's not all, because you take this phospholipid layer and you double it. You double it. And so the cell membrane actually has a structure that is known as a phospholipid bilayer because you're taking this right, and flip it upside down. And so what you're ending up with is you've got your hydrophilic heads with your lipid tails Right? But then just underneath of that, you've got another set of lipid tails and another set of phosphates. Right? So here's one layer of phospholipid. Here's the second layer of phospholipid, which creates a bilipid layer. Now, we're going we're gonna to explore this a little bit more on the next page. I got a better graphic of how that is organized. But not only do you have this plasma lemma, this membrane that is selectively permeable, and it's made up of these phospholipids that are arranged tail to tail as a bilayer, but this whole structure also must be able to maintain flexibility. Right? The membrane must be able to maintain flexibility. If it is rigid... If it is static, if it doesn't allow for movement, the stress and the force that's applied on the cell would cause it to break and rupture. Um, it's kind of one of the reasons, uh, you know, we, we, we have to be able to maintain this flexibility because we don't have anything else protecting that membrane. We don't have cell walls. We're not plants. Right? And so... Um, one mechanism of protection for the cell is to be able to maintain flexibility. If it bumps into something, everything can shift. Everything can juxtaposition within the membrane. So what does this look like? Well, this is exactly what we were just looking at uh, on the previous slide. The difference is... <clears throat> um, just the, it's, it's blown up a little bit. It's a little bit more of an arrangement. So up here, these are the phosphate groups with the choline. Okay. So you can see that this is polar. Right. We, we learned during biochemistry that when something is polar, it has the ability to interact with water. All right. It has the ability to interact with water. So this is hydrophilic. Right. Come down to the other end. 
Right. Here's the polar end down here. These are your phosphate groups right here. Here's the choline group right there. Right. This is also polar. And then look what happens going towards the middle of the membrane. Your lipids all face inward. And these are nonpolar. Right. And we learned in chapter 2 that nonpolar objects do not mix with water as readily. Right. So these are hydro phobic. These are hydrophobic. And so when we look at this, all right, again, this area right here and this area right here represents the hydrophilic portion. It represents the hydrophilic portion. All right. This is the choline. This is the phosphate. Right. So you got choline and you have your phosphate. Right. Again, you have your choline and you have your phosphate. But then in the middle, in the middle, here, and here you have your hydrophobic areas or your nonpolar regions. And what that means is that you've got yourself your lipids. There. And so if you look right here, you've got your, your you've got yourself your molecule of glycerol. That is right here. That's your glycerol molecule. Right there is your glycerol molecule. And attached to each of those glycerol models is one, two fatty acids. You've got yourself two fatty acid molecules that are sitting right there. Right. So once again, you've got yourself your hydrophilic area here that is made up of your phosphate group. And your choline group. All right. And this is hydrophilic or polar. And then in the middle here, you've got yourself your hydrophobic nonpolar area, uh, which is made up of your lipid. Right, which is your glycerol and your two fatty acids. You can see how the fatty acids, you can see how the lipids are faced inward to one another so that the center of the membrane is hydrophobic, but the outer edges are hydrophilic. Right, the outer edges are hydrophilic. So think of this as being the inside of the cell and think of this as being the outside of the cell. All right. So that's kind of the basic structure of um, the cell membrane, but of course it can't be quite that simple because we actually have proteins that are spaced throughout that phospholipid bilayer. Right. One of those things that we have within the phospholipid bilayer are integral proteins. Right. Integral proteins have integrated themselves through the membrane. Right. Integral proteins have integrated themselves. They extend through the entire membrane. And what they do is they allow things to pass from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell or vice versa. They allow things to go from inside of the cell back out. All right. The other thing that we have here that we find associated with um, uh, the cell membrane are peripheral proteins. And peripheral proteins are located on the outer edges. They're on the periphery of the cell membrane. Um, and so
They can be on either side. They can be either on the external side or the internal side. And very often we find these peripheral proteins um, have additional subunits that are usually attached to them. All right, so um, you can have glycoproteins, you can have glycolipids, um, you can have other various enzymes that are going to catalyze reactions uh, or change the internal environment in one way, shape, form, or another. But these are all proteins that are just, they remain on the surface. What are their functions? Well, for example, for, for things like glycoproteins or glycolipids, what you're really looking at is um, cell identification. All right. So these are these are proteins that mark these are proteins that mark the cell as being self. It tells the immune system these cells belong here. All right. This is legit. It's okay. Um, no issues here. All right. But you've also got other enzymes um, that will bind to things like insulin. All right. So insulin will bind to receptors on the surface of the membrane, the peripheral proteins. And when insulin binds to those receptors, it actually allows the, the, the membrane to become more permeable to glucose. And so glucose is then transported across the membrane to go into the cell. And that will become more um, apparent as we can move through this chapter. Right? As we move through this chapter. Um, one of the things I do want to, I kind of want to stress to you, and I don't know how this is going to work. I'm used to doing this with a a whiteboard, um, but we'll give it a try. All right, so you've got yourself your phospholipid bilayer. Right, you got your fatty acids that are extended down this way. They kind of look like the jellyfish from SpongeBob. Your integral proteins, just to kind of give you that visual representation, your, your integral proteins are going to start on one side and extend through the membrane. They're going to start on one side, and they actually squeeze in between the phospholipids. Right? That's an integral protein. Your peripheral proteins... stay on either side, but they do not extend throughout. Right? They do not extend throughout. So this would be a peripheral protein. And by the way, peripheral proteins are always hydrophilic right? because they are binding to um, the choline and the phosphate group the integral proteins, which are these guys right there, that's the integral protein. These guys are interesting because integral proteins um, pass through the choline and the phosphate group, and then they also pass through the lipid layer, and they come out on the phosphate and the choline side. So they're actually able to coexist in both the hydrophilic and the hydrophobic area. That is something that we refer to as being amphiphilic. In other words, the structure, in this case the integral protein, can interact with both uh, hydrophilic and hydrophobic molecules. All right. So they can do both and. They can do hydrophilic and hydrophobic interactions. And that's what your integral proteins are going to do. And again, this here just kind of gives you an idea of what exactly um, these cells look like when you put this all together. Right? You can see that you've got yourself some peripheral proteins. You can see you've got yourself some integral proteins that are that are uh, scattered throughout there. 
just kind of good to be able to recognize, right? again, location-based. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about their functions um, as we progress into the next video. All right. Um, here's another way to look at this, and this is actually going to be a good stopping place for us. Um, think of think of the cell membrane, the plasma lemma, as being a swimming pool. Right? You've got yourself your your little tennis balls that are floating on the top. Right? Your tennis balls represent the phospholipid bilayer. <clears throat> your rubber ducky inner tube. Right? Your rubber ducky inner tube. Uh, that is your integral protein because it is passing through the tennis balls, and so it's actually inserted itself in between all of those little tennis balls or the phospholipids. Um, and then the raft over here, that would be your peripheral protein. All right. Uh, what happens if I was to drop a bowling ball into here? You know, everything is going to move to one side. Right? The tennis balls are all going to move. Right? The rubber ducky uh, inner tube is going to move. The floating mat is going to move. And then eventually what will happen? They'll come back. Right? Will they always end up in the same space that they started? Absolutely not. Right? They won't. Right? And so, even without any disruptions, these integral proteins have the ability to meander through these phospholipids. The peripheral proteins have the ability to meander on top of the phospholipids. The phospholipids have the ability to move throughout. It is what we refer to as the fluid mosaic model. Right? Mosaic because the cell membrane is made up of these various structures that are not physically connected. They are independent of one another. Integral proteins can independently move throughout the membrane. Peripheral proteins can independently move throughout the protein or throughout the phospholipid, the membrane. The phospholipids can independently move throughout the membrane. Each one of these little segments, each one of these little aspects of the cell membrane are each independent of one another. They're each independent of one another. but yet they come together to create this one structure. Hence the term mosaic. Fluid, because they have free ability to move. They can drift and meander throughout the membrane. So you gotta wrap your head around this. Remember what we said, one of the key characteristics of a membrane uh, of a plasma lemma, a cell membrane, was that it had to have regulatory features, selectively permeable, and it had to be able to maintain flexibility. This fluid mosaic model allows for regulation, selective permeability, through the use of integral proteins, through the use of integral proteins, and it allows for flexibility because each of these parts, each phospholipid is independent of all of the other phospholipids. Each integ integral protein is independent of all the other integral proteins and the peripheral proteins and each of these phospholipids. The peripheral proteins are independent of each other in of, the, uh, of the other peripheral proteins as well as the integral proteins as well as the phospholipids. So there's a mosaic in there that comes together to create this one structure that is very effective at maintaining flexibility, but yet regulating what is coming in and out. And so um, with that, uh, there is your introduction into chapter three. Uh, we're going to start looking at some of the regulatory features um, pertaining to selective permeability in video two. So with that said, um, I'm going to catch you guys on the flip side and keep doing what you're doing.